one of my favorite traditions as a kid was going with my father to Barnes and Noble in the summer and picking up a Phil Steele magazine. Phil now joins us. Phil, I didn't think the magazine could reach the the highest of quality that it, that it has, but then you decided to put KJ Jefferson <laughs> on one of the covers in this one. We appreciate you joining us this morning, Phil. Hey, I appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, I tell you what, KJ and Arkansas deserves to be on the cover. The job Sam Pittman's doing down there is ridic- ridiculous. You've got three guys as All Americans this year: Jalen Callan is you're on your first team, Bumper Pull on your second team, Ricky Stromberg on your first team. I want to start with Jalen. What stands out to you about the safety for Mansfield, Texas? Well, first of all, losing him the last seven games last year really hurt. And when he did come back, he wasn't quite the same player. Uh, he didn't do any hitting in the spring, but he should be 100%. But uh, he's one of the best safeties I've seen. He flies to the ball. He's an accurate hitter. And he just doesn't miss. He wraps up the tackler, plays fast. Uh, and I think his absence from the unit last year really hurt him. His absence coming back this year is really going to help him. But he's, he's one of the best safeties in the country. Phil, when you look at Arkansas and you look at the, the, the landscape of college football, Arkansas was one of the programs I think benefited the most from the COVID roster and being able to expand it. Uh, as you've evaluated, put your book together, how, how is your view or how will college football change and reshape itself this year in a post-COVID roster uh, uh, format now? Yeah, you know, you go back to uh, last year. And uh, last year, uh, I talked to probably, I'm going to say last year, I talked about 100, 110 of the 130 head coaches out there. And almost every one of them uh, was telling me, like it was something I'd never heard before, oh, my goodness, Phil, this spring, we are so deep. We were able to run three deep in spring practice. We've never done this before because of COVID. They had all the players coming back. Uh, the only teams that didn't have that advantage were teams like, you know, Clemson, which didn't win the ACC, wasn't even in the ACC title game. Ohio State wasn't in the Big Ten title game. Uh, Oklahoma was in the Big 12 title game because they lost so many players the NFL. But almost every team last year had 17, 18, 19 returning starters. This year, it's been a little bit more return to normalcy. We have uh, less returning starters coming back for the teams across the country. So I think the big thing I looked at magazine-wise is that you're going to see the return to power of teams like Clemson, like Ohio State, like Oklahoma this year, uh, because they're not at the deficit they were last year. So that's the biggest takeaway I have from the COVID thing is that last year, I would say over 100 of the teams was super experienced with 17, 18, 19 returning starters coming back. And this year, you look at Arkansas, for example, just four starters back on defense, seven on offense, lose six of the top ten tacklers on D. So I I think you're going to see a a step up for the the premier teams that uh, were more on a level playing field last year. One of those starters not coming back for Arkansas is Traylon Burks at wide receiver. What's your evaluation of Arkansas with its with its past catchers, and who do you think might have a breakout year for the Razorbacks and Kendall Bryles offense? Yeah, and, and losing uh, a player like Burks, as well as Morris, the number two receiver, hurts, but Burks is the big loss. Uh, the thing I like is that the, you know the transfer portal helped out here. Jaden uh, or Hazelwood comes in. He was my number two rated receiver coming out of high school. He originally signed at Oklahoma. I think that's a big pickup. And then one that I really like, and this one happened late in the magazine process. I don't know if the other magazines were able to capture it or not. And it's part of the reason we go to the press June 8th so that we can capture all the transfers that happened. But Matt Landers, watch out for this guy. He was my number eight wide receiver coming out of high school. He originally signed at Georgia, where Sam Pittman was. Last year he went to Toledo, and the first half of the year he wasn't doing much. The second half of the year, phenomenal year. In fact, I was going to put him a preseason first-team All-American. I thought in the Toledo offense, then now with the uh, with being on the team, he was going to have a big year. So I think the Landers... Hazelwood combination is really going to help. And then you got a guy like Keetron Jackson. He came in here very raw, very athletic, uh, but he, he look, it looks the part. He's a big athletic guy that can jump. Uh, Trey Knox at tight end. I, I like the unit. I still, despite the losses, rate it the number 40 unit in the country. We're talking with Phil Steele this morning here on the Morning Rush. Phil, you're, you kind of went into some guys that will be underrated. When you look at the conference this year, what part or what team in the SEC do you think is getting way too much hype heading into 2022? 
Well, it's the SEC, so I mean, uh, you know, I, it's it's tough to pick a team that's uh, that's overrated because uh, you look at the well, look at the West, for example. Uh, my thing there was who would you pick for last? I couldn't even pick a team seventh. I mean, so I picked two teams for six. Mississippi State got their tough schedule. And then LSU. And I don't think they're being overrated in the preseason, but I do think LSU's a team that's going to struggle more than a normal LSU team would struggle. They're still trying to figure it out uh, at the quarterback spot. The offensive line is my biggest question mark there. They lose practically everybody from last year. You wonder how that's going to turn out. I do think the defensive line is going to be good, but they have a new coaching staff. They have a lot of turnover, a lot of players coming in, a lot of players going out, a lot of transition. And this is a team that wasn't overwhelming last year. LSU uh, last year finishing 6-7. and seven. Now, it was a depleted team that lost to Kansas State. But I'm going to say LSU, I've seen them picked as high as third or fourth in the SEC uh, West. I think they struggle a little bit more than people expect. One of the things that kind of picks up middle of the season is the Heisman Trophy race. And Tommy and I have been talking about this could be a potential year where you have a back-to-back in Bryce Young. Caleb Williams out at USC is going to have something to say about that, as does C.J. Stroud in Columbus. Is this a quarterback award this year? Can you see anyone else coming out of the woodwork, Phil, that's not playing the quarterback position? Yeah, I'll throw a couple of names out at you. I think, uh, you know, you look at Ohio State alone, they probably have three Heisman candidates there. They've got, of course, the quarterback, C.J. Stroud. They've got a wide receiver in Jackson Smith. And and remember, last year, they had two first-round draft picks at wide receiver. And all that uh, Jackson did was not only lead the team in receiving, but break Ohio State's uh, single-season record for receptions in the season, despite playing with two first-round draft picks at the wide receiver position. So he should have a huge year this year. They've got Travion Henderson at the running back spot. And then a name to really keep an eye on. It seems like the Heisman voters are out there itching to put somebody that's not a quarterback. I think a Will Anderson. They'd like to get a, it seems like when you look at the votes, that the, and I'm a Heisman voter, by the way, but I, I, I go with the best players. But it seems like they're trying to put a defensive player in there, and Will Anderson coming back I think is huge. He's a dominating force on the Alabama defense, and uh, I think he's going to pick up some votes as well this year. Phil, last year we saw Jordan Davis, the nose tackle, the inside technique for Georgia gets some, some Heisman love, and deservedly so. He was the nastiest guy uh, that played that interior defensive line. Who are going to be some of the, uh, the, more, the, the, the more handfuls, if you will, this year for opposing offensive lines? And who is at the top of your list for uh, defensive interior linemen this year in the SEC? Well, I, I think when you, uh, you you go right back to Georgia, they've got, uh, the, you know, a lot of the NFL draft guys that I talked to uh, were talking about uh, Georgia and what they have up front, Jalen Carter, and said he may be better than the guys they had last year. So keep your eyes on Jalen Carter. I think he's going to step out and have a big year. And then Ojolari for LSU. I think LSU's defensive line is the strength of their team. I think he has a good year. And then how about Derek Hall of Auburn? And, uh, you know, Hall's a guy that sort of under the radar playing at Auburn. I think expectations are low for Auburn this year. But he could step up and have a big season as well. And then, as mentioned, Will Anderson's one guy everybody's got to watch this year. You mentioned you talked to 110 or so of the 130 Division I head coaches or FBS head coaches. Uh, in your conversations with Sam as a new head coach, you, you had some praise for him coming into the interview and the, the results. What, what, what's your impression or takeaways from those one-on-one conversations with, with Sam Pittman? Uh, he's doing a phenomenal job. I mean, he's, they've pulled five upsets in the, in the two years he's been there. You look at his first-year situation, uh, he didn't have an overly talented team. Uh, he had a team that was playing 10 SEC games, was an underdog in all 10 games, and somehow won three and probably could have won a couple more that first year. And then you go back to last year, the way they dominated Texas A&M uh, and Texas early on in the season. Uh, I think that uh, Coach Pittman is doing a phenomenal job building this team. As mentioned, uh, you know, he was one where I've been on the Joe Moore Award Committee for years, and the Joe Moore Award Committee loves him. All those guys love him as an offensive line coach, and now you got to love him as a head coach. Very impressed with every conversation I've had with Coach Pittman. We're talking with Phil Steele this morning. Phil, the biggest college football news as of late has been conference expansion movement and whatnot. And the, the Pac-12 it, it could be on the. I, I wonder, in your opinion, who is who is facing a graver danger right now? Is it the Big 12 without Texas and Oklahoma, 
or is it the Pac-12 without UCLA and USC? Yeah, it seems like right now it is definitely the Pac-12 is on shakier ground. And I think that goes to uh, the West Coast is probably not as dominant of a football market as it is maybe more towards the uh, the Big 12 area. So I think, I think the Big 12 uh, is on better ground than the Pac-12 right now. But, guys, this is getting a little ridiculous out here, isn't it? <laughs> you asked me five years ago what's going to happen, and, and, I would, and I did say – we're going to have five 16-team super conferences. Well, that's probably changed now. You're probably going to have two or three 20, 25-team super conferences the way it's going. The Big Ten and the SEC are clearly the kings. They dominate football. And if you're not in the Big Ten or the SEC, you're just hoping uh, to survive. But I'd say the Big 12 has a better chance of surviving right now, which is unfortunate. You know, I'm an Ohio guy, and uh, growing up, the big game for me every year was, of course, the Rose Bowl because I was in Big Ten country, and it was you know Big Ten against Pac-12. And to see the Pac-12 go by the wayside would really be something. So on that point, Phil, you've covered college football, watched it, talked about it for a long time. Do you like the way that the conferences and where the sport is trending, or is it just one of those things where you're just kind of going with the flow at this point? Yeah, I'm a traditionalist, so for me, I, I liked it the way it was, but Heck, I used to like the Southwest Conference that Arkansas was in with their matchups against Texas. So, uh, you know, it, the one thing that is certain about college football, and we've seen it these last two years ridiculously with NIL, with the transfer portal, with conference changing, is there's going to be change. So you can't fight it. You just got to go along with it. But as a traditionalist, uh, it's tough for me at times to, to see some of these conferences moving around like they are. Should the sport of college football have its own division? I mean, as, as far as the top 64 or so teams uh, move into a fourth or a new division, uh, it seems like there's a clear separation in the haves and the have-nots at the top of college football. Yeah, it does appear that we're, we're heading that way, and it, it seemed like, as I mentioned uh, five years ago, I said we're heading to five 16-team super conferences. Uh, we might have something different coming up with three or four, but uh, yeah, it it seems inevitable. Uh, there's a lot of things that seem inevitable in college football, but heck, you know, I, last week at this time, I wasn't expecting USC and UCLA to be switching over to the Big Ten. Yeah, I mean, I, I was. We were talking earlier in the show just about possibilities and scenarios. I could even see a world down the line where you might play with one group of teams and one conference for football, while your other sports in the winter and in the spring play. Uh, playing a different group of teams or a different conference. You could certainly with the uh, the separation geographically of some of these schools, it, it's going to create challenges beyond just football. So I think it, it would be very interesting to hear some of those behind the scenes conversations, Phil, with, uh, with all the commissioners and the power brokers. Yeah. And I agree with you a hundred percent there. Football rules the world, but I mean, the travel for, look at the big 10 travel to go from USC to Rutgers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, a big, travel thing there so i can see that happening with the other sports uh i focus on what's happening on the field so I, i'm not an expert by any stretch in, in conference realignment or anything like that but uh it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out it is the conversation of the day all right so before we go give us kind of your prognostication your thoughts on how the 22 season's going to roll out for the razorbacks this year in their 12 games well, I, yeah, I think it's going to be somewhat like last year, a good start. Uh, I look at Arkansas getting past Cincinnati, South Carolina, Missouri State, all at home. Then they reach a pretty rough stretch there in the middle of the year. Uh, A&M is going to be a tough game at Arlington. They are loaded talent. You look at the way Jimbo's been recruiting, not just this past year, but every year he's been there. He's brought in tremendous recruiting classes, and they are a very deep team. When I talk to Jimbo and go over the team with them, I think next year they've got a shot at contending for – the tops in the SEC West with the talent they're accumulating. And then, of course, Alabama uh, at home is going to be a tough one. Miss State with the Cowbell is going to be tough, but not unwinnable for Arkansas. And that's one of those games where Coach Pittman, who's been pulling up sets, could do it. Same thing with BYU. It's tough playing out in the altitude. BYU is a veteran team. They've got everybody back. Uh, I think that's one of those toss-up games as well. And then you look at the rest of the season down the stretch, I think Arkansas turns it back on again. The Auburn game is going to be tough. Both teams are off a bye. 
I think Auburn's better than everybody expects this year. So that's going to be a tough game. But then they should be able to beat Liberty, LSU. I've got them favored over Ole Miss at home and at Missouri. So I think it's a strong start to the season, a strong finish. And if they pull a couple upsets in the middle of the year, uh, they could actually be a contender in the West. But uh, Sam Pittman has overachieved my expectations both years, and I expect him to do so once again this year. As Frank Broyles said, they remember what you do in November. It sounds like you got a strong close to the season. Absolutely. I, I think they definitely win their last four games this year. And we saw last year getting to the bowl game and then beating Penn State like they did. That really helped. Phil, just for our audience, you can start picking up your magazine July 8th at Barnes & Noble. Is that correct? So that's that's Friday, yeah, right? It, yeah, it may hit Barnes & Noble's earlier. I was told last week it should be by the 4th, but now they're telling me the 8th. It should definitely be there. And here's the thing. There was a paper shortage this year. So we had to print the half of them, and we gave all that first shipment to Barnes & Noble. Then the second half is being printed later this week. Those will be hitting the, all the other places probably the end of July. So gas is important right now. The only place to look for them is Barnes & Noble, and that will be uh, for the next week or so, and then it will start hitting all the other places. Mm -hmm. Paper shortages. Yeah. Do you ever think you'd deal with that in your career? <laughs> uh, I I tell you what, guys, and then I go to Colorado to, to do a, a magazine signing and help mail out the magazines, and the printer delayed. They didn't get it done on time. So it, it's just been a frustrating Jeez. year magazine-wise. But you know what? It's it's all going to turn out good. Man, going through a lot of stuff. Well, Phil, we appreciate you uh, making some time for us this morning, and hopefully Sam Pittman uh, outdoes expectations again as he did in the first two years. Appreciate you coming on. Hey, always a lot of fun talking football with you guys. You know that. All right. Phil still with us here on the Morning Rush. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's Wimbledon Finals, Major League Baseball, the latest fighting news, and even next season's early NFL futures. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BLEAV. That's BLEAV to get the bonus and get into the action. Bet online where the game starts.